Okay. So again, good morning. I'm Alex Cortez. Uh, I am the an executive leadership coach with the San Diego County Office of Education. And I want to thank you for joining us for the San Diego, San Diego School Counselor Con. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and really learn from all the uh, professionals, the experts in counseling. I was just telling to our guest speakers today how valuable uh, in my role as a principal when I was at a site, how valuable I saw them as in as school counselors in the work they do with our students, the impact that they had um, in supporting our kids, um, not just academically, but emotionally and just making those connections. So uh, it's an honor to be here and just continue to learn more about their great work that they're doing for our students and specifically today for our English learners. Uh, so today's title for our session is how school counselors can best support English learners. Um, and so again, I'm gonna be your room moderator. I'll be helping, assisting with, uh, with the chat, but I believe the, our hosts are gonna have that also under control but I'll be here to support in any other way possible. Uh, feel free to use the chat to ask questions during the session. And now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Elizabeth Montiel, Allison Liu, and Ruben Escobar from San Marcos High School. And um, welcome Ruben and take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Alex for the great uh, introduction. Um, Ruben Escobar, school counselor out of San Marcos High School. I uh, primarily work with English learners on my caseload. So I have about 200 English learners and then about 250 other students uh, from the rest of the alphabet. Um, I have to start off by saying, you know, in a way an expert on English learners, but I'm very, very, very well experienced on interacting with them and have tons of experience, uh, you know, five plus years as being a specific English learner counselor. I don't know if anybody can claim they're an expert because it's an ever evolving field. And I just hope to share some knowledge today with my team here. Uh, Elizabeth Montiel, a school counseling intern and uh, many other duties. Allison Leon is our college and career center coordinator. Um, also a school counseling intern with many other duties that she has as well. Um, and today we just hope to share our experiences to hopefully ignite that fire, light that passion within all of you um, so that you can uh, work interact with this great group of students, English learners that be doing that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass Elizabeth Montiel and she started this and uh, we'll there. thank you all for joining us. Um, I do see some school out there from other, yeah, so thank you. And uh, we'll go from there, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, everybody can see that okay? <laughs> so thank you so much, everybody, for coming today to our presentation. Um, you know, English language learners are a diverse group of students with different language, academic, and social emotional needs. And um, today's presentation, we're going to be covering, um, you know, how we as school counselors can ensure their educational experience is the best that it can be. But before that, we wanted to get started with a little activity. Um, we would love it if you guys say hello in another language, uh, or you can put it in the chat. So everybody can see, you know, all of us that are multilingual learners. I see a lot of olas in there too. <laughs> we want to get as many languages as we can. So even if it's not a language you speak, but you might just know how to say hello. <laughs> And it's great. Ciao, bonjour. And then, um, you know, if you have, speak any other languages, we would also love it if you let us know. Um, again, probably a lot of you guys are multilingual learners. English and Spanish. English, Spanish, and Mandarin, Allison. <laughs> Very 
very, very nice. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so obviously, you know, we are not here to educate you on the types of English learners, but this is some of the terminology that is gonna help us during our presentation today. Um, so we do have our long-term English learners. Uh, those are the students that have been here more four years or more in the United States who are still identified as English learners and they could have even been born in the United States. Um, we also have our newcomers. So those are the newly arrival students um, to the US. And we have our reclassified fluent English proficient students. And these are the students that um, based on the LPAC scores, like style scores, et cetera, um, they've been able to re reclassify. Um, EL students are assessed via the LPAC, um, which is you know, an annual exam, and it measures their reading, writing, listening, and speaking abilities. Um, so again, some of the questions would be, are these students English learners or multilingual learners? Um, what, la what languages do EL students think in? Um, do they have to decode or translate information? I'm gonna share a little bit of my personal story. I am a former English learner. I, um, I was born and raised in Guadalajara until the age of nine. Um, uh, I immigrated to California with my brother, with my sister and my, my mother. Um, I began fourth grade um, and I was placed in, back then it was called the ESL program. So I was ESL program level one. Uh, at first, obviously, it was very difficult for me to succeed in school um, because I felt pressure not only to learn the class content, but uh, I just felt that urgency of, you know, needing to learn English as, English as soon as I could. Um, it was just that need that I had in me to just be like other students, like other kids at school, right? Fourth grade was a very difficult year for me. Um, you know, I felt like I wasn't good enough because I didn't know English and I was really hard on myself. But again, it's probably, <laughs> it was just my, my sense of feeling like I just, I need to speak English and I need to speak it now. So fifth grade, um, it was very different. Um, my fifth grade teacher was actually, I call her my angel. Um, she was also an immigrant. She was from Aguascalientes, Mexico. Um, her and I connected immediately. Um, she helped me to realize that, you know, my intelligence wasn't really defined by my lack of English language skills, right? So she would take the time during lunch and even after school to meet with me, to help me, to help me, you know, practice my speaking, practice my reading, my writing skills. Um, and I remember that year I went from being uh, unable to write not even one sentence in English to writing an entire, it was a two paragraph essay which um, I was given the opportunity to read out loud, you know, for the entire school. Again, being an English learner, this was quite an accomplishment for me. Uh, the following year, I was officially reclassified and I went back to my fifth grade teacher and she was the first person I told. I was very excited. Um, and so, you know, as a school counselor, we just, we have to remember, we, we don't wanna forget, um, you know, some of the connections that we make are sometimes connections for life. Um, you know, to this day, Mrs. Contreras, who is my fifth grade teacher, she's still in my life. She, um, she, can, she was and she continues to be that trusted adult for me, that support person that, um, you know, um, when I decided to go to college, she was the one that encouraged me. When I decided to pursue my master's degree, she was the one that encouraged me because I'm the first, you know, first generation college graduate and she was there and she's still there for me, which is amazing. Um, so now that I'm finishing, you know, schooling and I'm going to become a school counselor, you know, and now it's my turn to, to do the same for other students, um, you know, support and relationships are crucial for student success. And I, I want to be their trusted adult. You know, I want to be there to encourage and support them al along the way. Um, and it's, it's easier to relate to them when you have the same cultural background. Um, so, you know, I, I want us to never forget, you know, the impact we may have on others. Um, and the difference that you as a school counselor um, can have in the life of a student. All right, and I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, and, you know, thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing your story. And, you know, we do wanna think about, you know, for some school counselors, it's, it's easier to relate to your English learner students if you have a similar cultural background or linguistic background, but, you know, that doesn't have to be a limiting factor to us. I think a lot of times we feel like, oh, our one English, our one Spanish speaking counselor, that's the person that needs to do this job and nobody else. Uh, but really connecting to all of our students is all of our job, right? No matter what your identity. 
So I am white, born in America, but I can still be a good cross-cultural educator the same way all of us can, you know, because again, this is a responsibility of our entire team, no matter our background, you know? So we just want to remember good cross-cultural communication skills. And when we're working with an EL student, are we making sure that we speak slower and not use colloquial language? You know, try to speak to their level of English because that's also good for them because now they're also practicing their English, but, you know, you're meeting them at their level. So they're able to interact with you. Um, and of course, you know, we all know a smile goes a long way. You know, are you being comfortable and talking through those awkward moments, allowing for science silences, allowing them to use translation devices, just creating that welcoming environment, you know, and if I don't know about their background, I can ask them, give them an opportunity to teach me where they come from. You know, it's a learning experience for both of us. So, you know, just keep in mind and, you know, especially at our school, I know every school is different. Most of our EL students are native Spanish speakers, but that is not the case for all of them. So we can't just come into their classroom and start speaking in Spanish because that's going to leave out our students who are Mandarin speakers or Tagalog um, or even some of our Spanish speakers who are not native Spanish speakers. They speak actually an indigenous language as their first language. So, you know, just keep it in mind that this is the work of all of us, no matter our own cultural background. And Elizabeth, you can hit the next slide. And we just wanted to hear a little bit more from you guys now. So if you don't mind sharing in the chat, what is your role at your school working with English learners? Are you a counselor who has some English learners in your caseload? Um, do you work for a specialized program? Um, so if you can just give us a, um, some input in the chat, we'd love to hear from you. And then also any challenges you might be facing. So we'll go ahead and give you guys a second if you want to tell us. Good, it's looking like a number of you have EL students just in your caseload. They're spread out for a lot of them. Oh, great, with Spanish speakers and Arabic speakers. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful, thank you guys for sharing that. All right, so if you haven't yet, you can still keep posting, but I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Ruben. Um, and he can talk a little bit about his role at our school um, and how our school has kind of addressed um, the needs of this specific population. All right, getting the uh, technology worked out here. Close something up, my apology. And... All right, I think I've got this going. All right, is my screen up, Allison? We are looking at your desktop, which is overwhelming Excellent. me right that now. That is not what we want to do, yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I think I got the right one now. Got it, you got it. Perfect, uh, yeah. Um, as Allison and Elizabeth said, you know, it's it's some build relationships and we have this little image here because our students, our English learners can really come from any country um, and any background. They can speak so many languages. I mean, I've had students come from, you know, the Ukraine, Russia, other Eastern European nations and, and come with like seven languages. And it's like, wow, like, and, and here you are learning English and they might even already know English to, to a certain extent. So it's really, um, we need to know our audience. We need to know who we're interacting with, who we're working with. I know some counselors in this room said, you know, East County, um, you know, we have Middle Eastern populations or from certain nations in Africa or things like that. Like you just have to know who your, your students are, where they come from and get to learn about them. If, you know, I'm a speaking individual, Latino male that, you know, I can connect with Spanish speaking students, great. I also need to connect with students from other countries. And it's, you know, having those genuine caring qualities 
that can take us a long way because you build that relationship, the students are going to share information with you. You're going to become that trusted individual. And again, though, and anything and anything is going to be possible. What I wanted to really dive into next is a lot of times counselors face challenges. You know, I have 450 students myself. Others may have you know, bigger caseloads. And how do we balance it all out? Like, how do I focus attention to English learners when I'm trying to, you know, help out my seniors or I'm trying to help out other populations? And so with this little section here, I just wanted to highlight that at one point, San Marcos High School didn't have a counselor devoted to working with English learners. And I'm going to share some data, like, you know, what that looked like. And now that we do have an, an English learner counselor, like, how did that make a significant difference? So I'm going to go into some data next. And so, as you can see, 2014-15, going into 15-16 as well, we didn't have an EL counselor. And we didn't have many um, ELs enrolled in honors or AP classes. Is it because they just didn't have the ability? Oh, well, they don't speak English, so they can't take higher level classes. No, these kids are smart. They can, you know, just pair them in, into the right spots that work best for them. So again, really learn about the students themselves. Everyone's an individual and everything case. What are that students? Interest? What are the qualities? And as you can see over time, having an EL counselor, you know, we made a, a huge 350% increase in the amount of students now taking honors in AP classes. It's like, wow, like what investment take place that our students were able to make that giant leap. It was, again, just someone learning about them, someone believing it, and me not taking no for an answer, like, no, an honors English isn't going to be hard for you. I see you. I believe in you. Um, taking classes that are to their abilities. We have engineering honors, Spanish language, Spanish literature, you know, a bunch of other things. It's really finding those best placements for the students, and like I said, learning about them and believing in them. Um, so again, the amount of students that we've had graduating with more honors or AP classes time at the tail end on the 2018, we didn't have any L counselor and less than half of our English learners um, ever took an honors or AP class. Again, I've been in the role, I've been encouraging my students not taking no for an answer. And with the current class of EL students that I have, 86% my English learners, every single one has taken an honors or AP class. Only 13% of my seniors that are English learners have not. That's huge. It's like, wow, like almost every single EL student has been able to find something that works for them in an honors or AP because again, we believed in them and we made a connection happen. Um, a through G, another big piece of data that people always look at and you know, we're rates for English learners. Without an English learner back in 2016, super, super low, 12%. Um, but again, over time, some significant gains. Like I said, putting students in more honors and AP classes, having that one-on-one -on -one attention. Uh, me as their counselor, again, pushing and believing versus having our English learners spread out to every single counselor. And I got to and meet every single English learner student, be with them for two, three years, four years, however long, and now we're almost at 40% of our English learners graduating with um, meeting the A through G requirements. So again, it's, it's not that the students don't have the ability or they don't know the language, it's just making that connection with them, finding the best placements. Um, there's a whole lot of other things I'll discuss in a moment too, because this is not just me making this happen, but all the partnerships that I've made along the way so that my students are able to have success. Um, wanted to briefly talk about a multi-tiered approach to working with English learners. Um, and really at the bottom, that footnote is it's almost every single piece of work that we do with our English learners is a, a tier two or tier three intervention because um, they're a specific population and everything is um, individualized. I can't say I'm you know, giving this to the entire school and English learners are going to benefit. They may or may not. They need more individualized efforts and attention. And so in tier two, I mean, it's again, strategically reaching out to students who may have challenges with English language. Um, meeting with students who are at risk of earning B or F grades and making those partnerships, collaborating with our English English learner coordinator, with teachers. At San Marcos High, we had a couple of different models. We had a co-teaching model where you know, two teachers were, were in place for English learners. Um, we've had Sadai based classes where they were just isolated and you know, it was a US history for English learners. Again, trial and error, we, we found things that worked and didn't work. 
but um, now we have like a clustered model where we have specific teachers that we've partnered with and those teachers have extra knowledge in working with English learners, their patients, their understanding. Uh, and so the partnership piece in all of this is gonna be crucial. So if at your school you have certain teachers that teach English learners, um, get to know them, befriend them, um, talk to them about your students. Because again, once you have that level of connection with, with your staff, your teachers, everyone who's really part of the team, it's gonna be a greater opportunity for our students. Like I know at my school, if I wanted to put a student in an English honors class, I have one, two English honors teachers that I have full confidence in. I say, you know, look out for this student and they'll do their best and my student will shine. Um, in the tier three setting, I mean, we have individual counseling um, and really the big piece is, is trying to find resources for these students, resources. And so identifying students who might unaccompanied youth or even McKinney Vento, like they at risk of being homeless, because um, a lot of times I have English learners coming from other countries, you know, Mexico, Guatemala, Salvador, and other places, and they're just kind of coming to live with a family member or coming to live with someone who's taken on a guardian role. And unfortunately, those situations don't always work out. So it's it's really identifying them for certain resources, like I said, McKinney, maybe the bus passes, they can get a um, backpack program full of food. And, and so many more connections that I can make even with our school social workers. So they can have, you know, individualized or group counseling, um, identifying students for the migrant education program. So if they have family that was in, you know, migrant setting fields, if they moved around every now and then, migrant education also has programs available for our students. So again, it's, it's finding resources so that you're not the only one trying to make a difference in their lives. You build up that team around you. Like we always say, it takes a village build that village because these students are some neediest and we need to help them find resources. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with like Operation School Bell. Some schools have some don't, but oftentimes they, you know, provide gift cards to like stores or to like shoe stores. The Lions Club, sometimes through the nurse's office, Lions Club can provide free eyeglasses. Um, and I've even had outside agency say, do you, do you have anybody that needs dental work? Well, Provide some students with free dental. So again, knowing the resources around your region um, and being able to provide those to students. And of course, referring to outside agencies as well as we do with any student is, you know, if there's mental health or other concerns, trying to connect them with other stuff so they can have all the support they can so that when they're meeting with you, you have the academic, college, career, personal, social, all those things taken care of. And you also have support from others. Um, like I said, it takes a village, and I never would have got anywhere with my English learners and some of the data that I presented without having a number of people that are on this list part of my team. And so I've definitely partnered with, you know, English learner coordinator, and you can see the long list there, um, our career center coordinator, Allison, um, tutors, psychologist, nurse, everybody, you name it, and you need to get everyone part of the team. Um, that's the bottom line, because like I said, you can't do this alone. You need so many other people to have eyes on these students and to build partnerships with so that um, the success is there. And so how do we connect students to the campus? Again, it's, you know, our, our high school, San Marcos High School, the biggest in the whole county, 3,600 students with about 200 English learners. How do you make English learners comfortable at your school? when they can go outside and they look around and like, yeah, none of these kids look like me. You know, half of our school is a Hispanic population, the other half mostly white. Um, so again, how do you make students who don't speak the language comfortable in your setting? That's where as a school counselor, you know, I apologize in advance if, if my uh, excitement, enthusiasm, just overall emotion kind of takes over in a second as I jump into some of these things, but it, it again, have to have that passion. You can't just assign someone to be the EL counselor if they don't want to do it. You have to have the person in place that wants to do it. And for me, I am that person. I would want to make that difference. So here's a few kind of initiatives, strategies, things I've done along the way to really help our students connect to school. So over time, I've kind of formed a, a welcome committee, so to speak. We used to have, you know, a TA, so to speak, that would show the students around campus eventually started falling through like I couldn't rely on certain people anymore so I just out of the boot why don't I just make my own committee why don't I just reach out to my own students who I believe in already 
Um, so I started identifying students who are English learners, who've already been here a year or two, kind of know the system in our school, or even non-EL students who can speak the same language as someone else. So like, if I had a student who spoke Russian and I have a student coming from Russia, hey, let me pair you together. Um, a student from China who, again, let me pair you with someone who speaks Mandarin. Um, so that they may or may not, you know, have a connection. Some students, they don't want that connection. I just want to learn English and, you know, just throw me in there. I want to learn trial by fire. Others, no, I need that. Yes, put, put me with someone that speaks my language so I can have that success. Um, and again, it's case by case. Not every student is the same. You can't have the same magic formula that's going to help this student and also help the other. Um, so and I've started forming that welcome committee where they can give students tours around the whole school, show them this is your first period, your second period, your third period. Hey, and they even share contact information. Here's my cell phone number. Here's my email. Let's get in touch. You know, they don't have to be friends, not, you know, making that happen, but um, it's, it's allowing the students to, to start off with a connection. And it can blossom into something else naturally. Um, but if you just let a student, especially right now virtually, you let an English learner come to your school, they're going to be so lost. Like, that's the sad reality. Um, in a physical format, I would put all, you know, I would bring the people into my office and, hey, I'm just introducing you to this person and this person. Much more difficult in a virtual setting. Um, here's an example of one effort I did. Um, in the middle, I have, you know, two siblings here that came from the country. You know, not much English, they're kind of going to be lost and I'm just going to place them in classes and good luck. Like, that's not my style. I definitely don't do that. So if you look, you know, all around, uh, Miss Montiel's at the bottom there, I'm at the top, but we have four other students that I just, hey, I have a new students coming from another country. Are you willing to join a Zoom meeting with us just to meet them, get to know the students? And so these other students were students I identified as leaders and I really just, you know, I set the tone, I introduced it, and then the students just kind of talked on their own. Like, yeah, let me tell you, this is what it's about our school. They shared contact information. If you have any questions, like, by all means, reach out to me. Um, so it was building a connection with others, their peers, so they can have someone to relate to. And again, I'm not saying they have to be friends, but at least they're sharing contact information or getting to know each other. They may have class together so that the students don't feel alone right off the bat. Um, another thing we attempted this year was an advisory. So our school, I'll spare you all the details of our school changes, but, you know, we switched to a four by four model and we threw in an advisory time period. So myself, the English learner coordinator decided, let's make something magic, you know, let's make something special out of this. So we invited our ELD students, ELD level ones, level twos, level threes. Um, a lot of newcomers, so mostly from Spanish-speaking countries. And we said, let's let's just have a group for them. So as at the top, some staff members, some I labeled as student leaders. So we identified some you know, students that have been at our high school for a few years and said, you know what, we see you as someone with, with some talent, some leadership capabilities. And you know, some of them didn't believe in themselves as leaders, but it was us saying, I know you're a leader. I see it in you. And I want you to be a part of this group to help others that are brand new at our school so that they can see you and have, that, have you as a mentor, as a role model. That person did it, they came from Mexico, I'm coming from Mexico. Like, you know, they can have the opportunity too. So we created this advisory group, which any of you could do because we, we were all using Zoom or Google Meet or some other stuff. You could just put people together. Obviously you had to craft it and kind of, you know, build the foundation. But now this, this has become something beautiful that I'm you know, very proud of because as the staff members, we really just sit back. Our student leaders, they lead everything. They create PowerPoint presentations, icebreakers every single day. Um, and the whole thing's run in Spanish, the language that the students know. So again, it's building that comfort level. And then we just started a new term and other students have just been asking us, we want to be part of that advisory. How, how do we get in there? Like we're, we're new to the country too. How do you put us in there? So what was something that we didn't know how it was going to work has actually become something really, really powerful. Um, you know, the students have laughed together. They have even cried together because at one point we, we created comics so or English learner coordinator, you know, paid for a site called Pixie that allows students to make comic books. And they all kind of shared their stories of coming to the U.S. and whether they had a support system or not support system and, and everybody just being um, open and vulnerable in that setting to say, this is kind of where, what I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling lonely and I want you to know. And they, they were able to share that with the entire group instead of bottling it up. 
And man, that was so powerful. And, and again, you know, I created mine too, my story of, you know, my family and sharing with them. And, and, you know, they, they didn't know about me in that sense, but now it gave them another view. Oh, dang, like, you know, Escobar, he is like us. Uh, he does have similar background. His parents came from Mexico and things like that. Like, it, it just allowed me to build a stronger relationship. And that's kind of what we need to do as counselors to build those connections with our students to help guide them, shape them as best we can. And, you know, as Cheryl Baker said, you know, her little reference that I love so much of the Mandalorian and all that. And here's our little uh, baby Yodas and like that. We're helping to, to guide them all along the way. Um, and, you know, do we want them to have a mediocre experience at our school or do we want them to have the best possible experience that they can have? For me, I want them to have the best possible experience. Um, I kind of created this funny little acronym. To me, it works. I like it. Um, how do you really relate to students? And it's in Spanish, but I say, be an amigo, an amiga. Um, I'm going to speed through that. Um, have some amor y cariño with them. Basically, you know, show them a little love, a little care. Like, yeah, I'm here for you. I got your back. Motivacion. Motivate them. Be that person in their corner every step of the way. Interes en su vida. Just show some interest. You know, oh, you do motocross, biking, BMXing, whatever. Cool. Tell me more about it. Not just you know, cut off conversation, but tell me more. I want to learn about you. Grades. Grados calificados because I mean, we're always going to naturally talk about grades. We're counselors. And then uh, at the bottom, orgullo y apoyo. Just, you know, pride, support. Again, I'm proud of you. Oh, man, you got that B in that class? Excellent. I knew you could do it. Um, this year, I kind of added that little X to the end. Um, one, riding the wave of Latinx, Chicanx, all those other things. But also in a verbal setting, extraño, I miss you. I haven't heard from you in so long. Or, man... You know, we're, we're not able to come into the office anymore. I wish I could be there and see you, but you know, I miss you. I, I, you know, if it, I wanna be there to support you. And you know, you got the, that great GPA last semester, awesome. So I think hey, this is all a little acronym of things that we can do to take it to the next level with our students. And later at the end, it's also a way that we can tell parents to interact with their students. Like you follow all these things, you could do that at home as a parent, showing interest for your students, motivating them, all of these different things. So it's also a tool that parents can do for their child at home. Um, connecting students to programs, all these different programs, I won't name them all, but and takes a village. If I get a student into the AVID program, AVID will take over. They'll be talking about college, um, university, academics, and pushing the student in that sense. Um, some of you might have reality changers, Gear Up, College Apps Academy, Simon Scholars, you know, all these other programs at your schools. So connect these students to those programs, make them aware of it, or even identify them. I see you as somebody who would be great for this program, and then the program takes over. And so less work that you would have to do because someone else is doing some of that heavy lifting. Um, again, creating leadership opportunities for students. I won't do all of these as well, but again, if I see it, certain qualities in students, I can nominate them for an ASB. Link crew, where 11th and 12th graders welcome ninth grade students to our campus. The leaders that are part of the advisory group that I mentioned earlier, they're part of our link crew. We've, we've nominated them for it. And so they, they kind of had some background skills already of welcoming students. And we just threw it into welcome new students who come to the country brand new. Um, career opportunities, internships, having them be TAs in ELD classes. I've had a couple that have been mentors or TAs so that they're again, a stronger student helping those who are still struggling with the language or with certain skills. Um, and so much more. Again, encourage them to take an honors or an AP class. Our school, we have a couple of classes that are easy in the honors and AP world. And so it's just pairing them with the right ones that I think they'll have success in creating those leadership opportunities. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Allison. So she's gonna talk about how we can prepare them a little bit in the academic and career world. Thank you, yes. And so, you know, kind of as Ruben said, I'm one of the people that he partners with, you know, as the career center coordinator and counseling intern, I work with the entire student body. Um, but I love, you know, Ruben comes to me and says, come on, let's put some events together um, to get his students into the career center. And I'll often too, like, I, I love it because Ruben will send a group of them. So I'll have five students come down together to come ask me a question. Um, and so it's, it's just really been rewarding helping work with these students. 
Um, and so, you know, some of these are things that Ruben does and then some that I partner with. So, you know, the continuous transfer review or transcript review, of course, this is Ruben doing this part, um, making sure his students are meeting those A through G requirements. Um, and then the second bullet point though, this is one that we do together. Um, he pulls in his A through G possible students. So this is, you know, after reviewing those transcripts, then he pulls in their students and their parents and, you know, this is for juniors, right? So they haven't finished A through G, but they're on track. And so he's saying, look, this is something you can achieve, which for many students, that might be the first time that they even thought, oh, I could go to a four-year school. You know, maybe they were, they knew they were college bound, but they hadn't dreamed that high yet. So, you know, Ruben's able to pull them in and we talk about that process very specifically in a way that they can understand. And, you know, these workshops, we do them in English and Spanish, you know, kind of a a sentence in English and a sentence in Spanish, you know, kind of, um, again, making that accessible for the students and their families. Um, and then again, we do more workshops when they're seniors for that hands on, you know, college application assistance, um, bringing them into the career center, you know, you sit, let's have the three of you sit here, and of course, socially distanced right now, right, um, and get them all working on their Palomar application together. And then I can kind of be behind them, walking them through that application. Um, definitely love, I always would rather have the students do that with me there where I can walk them through, you know, and, and help them when they say, oh, where do I click or what does this question mean? And we can do that together. You know, I will help them with every single question if that's what they need. And they may or they may not. Some of them are just sit down and once they have the space, they just get it done. And some need to ask a lot of questions. So, you know, just providing that space, whether it's virtual or in person, um, to help them through that process. And then of course, meeting with them after dis to discuss college decisions, future plans, and all of those things. And so this is just a picture of one of the workshops we held pre-COVID, I promise we wouldn't do this today. <laughs> um, but again, this is just bringing all the students in and actually working on their applications together. And we can just kind of float around, especially when we have a few counselors in there, um, a few staff members, and, you know, getting everybody to accomplish those goals. Um, and we really love as a school, we lean on this no pie until you apply. So we try to have them get all their applications done by Thanksgiving break. And, you know, so we definitely do some specialized events specifically for our EL students to help them to meet that same goal that we have for our whole campus community. And then, um, I don't know, Mr. Escobar, jump in if you want to, but um, this is just along the same lines as that, making sure that our students know all the ins and outs in the college application process and all the supports they get. You know, making sure they know that there's fee waivers, first of all, and actually getting them to apply for those so we can get them those application supports. And then, of course, on the ACT exam, they also have English learner support. And Ruben has worked very closely with many of his students to actually get them signed up for that so they can have extra support on the ACT. Unfortunately, not on the SAT, but they can on the ACT. Um, and, you know, they can use dictionaries. Um, I think on the next slide, um, we have some more of the things that the English, um, Elizabeth, you mind going to the next slide, please? Yes, so these are the English learner supports that students can get on the ACT. I mean, and as any of us who have worked with any standardized testing, we know that any little boost that we can give our students can make such a difference to them. So they can get small group testing, time and a half, or even self-paced testing. They can be approved to use a dictionary and even get translated test instruction. Um, and so again, we want all of our students who are eligible for these programs to get to take advantage of them. Very important. All right, I'll pass it off to Elizabeth. Thank you. And so we also provide financial aid assistance. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to remember is that we are the ones who they depend and rely on uh, for guidance and support. Um, so now, now more than ever, we have to be willing to put in the work and the time. Um, you know, building trust, trusting relationships with our EL students. Um, you know, having those personal and de delicate conversations, you know, to determine whether they qualify for FAFSA or the DREAM Act. You know, don't avoid those conversations, you know, family immigration status, um, tax information, you know, with the students and their families, um, 
You know, I've heard from so many counselors that are not willing to, you know, jump in on this. They're not comfortable with, you know, having access to personal information. Uh, but, you know, I just remind them, you know, this isn't about us. This is about doing what we have to do for our students, especially now that we're, we're, we're virtual, we have to make sure we're there for them. You know, parents are comfortable, you know, with us looking at their paperwork, we need to be comfortable as well. You know, we also provide hands-on FAFSA and uh, DREAM Act application assistance. We meet with them virtually, either through Zoom or Google Meet, and we have, we let them take the lead. We have them share their screen, and we are there with them as they're filling out their application. Um, we walk them through the entire process and answer any questions they may have. And this, you know, also includes setting up their FSA ID numbers for FAFSA um, or, you know, their PIN for the DREAM Act. Um, individual sessions, outreach and scholarship opportunities, making sure that, that we share this information with them so that, you know, they apply for those. Um, writing letters of recommendation for students, another thing that we do. Um, you know, we meet with them as many times as necessary to ensure that, you know, that we assist them with the applications and personal statements. Um, we meet with them to analyze and review their financial aid package. Um, you know, they come to us because they trust us. And, uh, you know, we've been with them as school counselors since the beginning, uh, encouraging them to do well in school, encouraging them to, you know, go to college. And, you know, it's important that we're there for them on this step as well. We don't want to leave them hanging. You know, this is a final step on them setting them up for, you know, college, we want to make sure that we're not, we're going to be there for them. Another big part is family engagement, um, you know, getting parents involved as attending and presenting at ELAC meetings. You know, sometimes this is the best way to ensure information reaches our EL families, nominating students for um, ELAC meetings so parents can attend and they can see their growth and progress. Um, hosting workshops, um, meeting with uh, meetings with information that's in, you know, their native language, separate meetings for Spanish speaking, um, you know, or other languages, um, connecting with families also through Google Classroom, Facebook, Twitter, um, and then also a phone call. A phone call can go such a long way and can make such a difference when communicating with parents. Um, be an advocate for families, you know, especially if they don't know the educational system, you know, IEPs, 504s, NTSS, you know, this being there with them. Um, you know, sometimes our EL families do struggle to connect with school um, and we don't want them to, you know, we don't want to wait for them to come to us and reach us somehow. We will need to remember that we need to meet them where they are. And again, as Mr. Escobar was saying, you know, the acronym of Be An Amigo also applies to, you know, parents and how they can relate to their child at home. So in this case, amor and cariño, um, you know, being warm and welcoming to their students, encouraging them, uh, motivating, motivating them to want to do well in school, you know, making sure that they're seeking out the assistance when they need it, um, showing interest in how they're progressing, how they're doing in school, you know, um, how, how are classes going, how are, you know, how are your grades, um, checking grades, we have, you know, parent view, we want to make sure they know that they can access that, that they can monitor their students' grades and they can check in with teachers. Um, and I've told many um, EL parents, you can email your teachers and do it in Spanish. There's people, you know, at school that speak the language and uh, the teachers will make sure that, you know, somebody translate for them so that they can get back to you. Um, and then again, orgullo, apoyo, you know, just making sure that that they, rate, rate, um, they just tell their students that, you know, they're proud of them and, you know, that everything they've accomplished and everything that they're gonna accomplish, they're there with them, you know, throughout the, the whole process. Um, and then I just remind parents all the time, you know, we're here for them just like we are for their students. You know, we may not be uh, there in person, but again, I always make sure to let them know they can reach out to me via email. Um, I have a Google number that I give to parents. I'm always giving it to parents and students and just letting them know, reach out at any time with questions. You can call me, leave a message, you can text me. Um, um, whatever questions you have, I'll make sure to get the answers you need and, and, and get back to you. So just knowing that uh, them knowing that they have a support system at school, um, you know, can make uh, a big difference. And then this is the end for us. Si se puede is basically our, our, uh, our main message. Go ahead, Mr. Escobar. <laughs> sure. No, yeah, I was just going to say, um, being a school counselor is difficult work for, for a school counselor. Being an English learner school counselor, oh, it's even more complicated. And, and oftentimes I say, like, you know, 
with my caseload. It might be 40% of my caseload that's English learners, but it takes 80% of my time because it's just the, the need is so, so much, um, but at the same time, so rewarding. So I personally take it upon myself, like, you know, I don't care how much time it takes. I, you know, had to pull in time after hours and things like that. But again, it's because I care about this population. I care about these students. And, you know, oftentimes I don't, I, I even watch my own terminology. Like, I don't say I work with English learners. I like to say it as, you know, some kind of a privilege for me. I, I interact with English learners. And even something like that to myself kind of flips the switch that, you know, I'm, I'm really there um, for a higher purpose. I'm not, you know, this isn't just something I do to get a paycheck because I really want to make that difference. Um, and so again, I encourage all of you out there that are, you know, part of this, this session of just, you know, what are you doing for English learners? Could you do just a little bit more? Um, if you're the English learner counselor specifically, hopefully some of the tips and things that we've done today could help you take something back to your school. If you're not an English learner counselor, you know, how, how can you support this population even more? Or at some point in the future, do you want to become the English learner counselor? Um, and again, working with English learner students can be so rewarding. It is complicated and challenging because as we mentioned, there's a lot of handholding necessary um, every step of the way. You know, students, parents don't necessarily know the education system well. If they come from another country, we're having to teach the education system as well as you know, them having to go through classes and learn the material. But again, if we're able to share and walk them through step by step by step, even if it takes extra time at the end, it's so rewarding. Just this week, myself and Elizabeth, and I think Allison too, we've you know got those special messages that, you know, for me it hit home, it hit to the heart, like, damn, you know, even you know, maybe shed a tear. The kids shared, you know, I made it. I got into college. I wouldn't have been able to get there without you. Like, because I just didn't know. And you helped me every step of the way. Or now I have a Cal grant. Now can I, you know, I can pay for college. Um, or the, the fact that I'm graduating, that's an accomplishment that nobody else in my family has done. And so those last little pieces of, you know, being the, the first family to graduate from a high school in the U.S. or being the first in their family to go off to a college and have some scholarship money to go with that. So, so rewarding. Um, and to me, I don't see my work with English learners as being a four-year thing. I see it as an extended piece because I also work with middle schools. Great to try to learn, okay, who are the students coming to me? What can you tell me about them? Um, so that I can start their course selection right and go above and beyond. I mean, I have some eighth graders that eventually are ninth graders, of course, eventually come to our school in ninth grade, first thing, hey, what's up, Escobar? Remember me, we met in eighth grade, we were talking about this and that. And I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like, I don't know who you are, but I'm gonna fake the funk. I'm gonna, okay, oh, oh, hey, what's up? Yeah, cool, good to see you, you know? Uh, what was your name or, you know, whatever, just, you know, don't ever, treat it as like, I don't know you, because that immediately will cut off that relationship. Even if you pretend you know who the heck you're talking to, um, it, it'll take you a little further because they, they have belief in themselves that you do actually care and you know every single name of the thousands of students that you have. But it's just showing that care and compassion. And you know, I also don't see my work ending at high school because now I'm at the point that I've been at San Marcos High for a number of years where my students are now coming back. They're like, hey, man, you remember that time? We had these deep conversations. You inspired me. And now I want to be a teacher. Now I want to be a counselor. And it's like, oh, man, like, I had that impact. Like, you know, I was, I was just being your school counselor. But, you know, you, you can have that lifelong impact. As Elizabeth mentioned, you know, she has um, someone that's been with her every step of the way. And for grad school, for undergrad, they're just, you know, they're still in her corner. And for me, the English learner counselor, I want to be that person in their corner and I never shut my door for English learners, you know, during the school day physically right now, text messaging everybody like crazy. Um, but the work is so rewarding. So I'll cut myself off there because I could talk for days about, you know, again, the passion of working with my English learners. Um, it, it's something I enjoy. It's something I love. And really, when I'm able to see that difference or the prize at the end that, you know, something great accomplished. That to me lights that fire and as, as challenging as things are, as challenging as they are in the pandemic someone telling me they got into college because I was able to help just a little bit more, huge. Yeah. So um, now we'd love to open it up if you have any questions and it looks like we have one. Um, Ruben, do you want to address this one? What does the year long schedule for a newcomer look like at SMHS? Do sure, they take an ESL problem. class all year long? And how about more advanced EL students? So uh, Peter, good to see you again. Uh, hope things are good out there in East County. Um, 
with um, our e students, I mean, we, we do an initial and intake with any newcomer that comes. So it's kind of a pre-assessment. I'm, I'm part of that process. Uh, one, because of Spanish and a lot of my students come from Spanish countries. So I kind of feel it out, you know, have a little mini interview with them in English and start making some decisions. Are you an ELD level one, level two? Um, our courses are set to be year long, but there's flexibility. In the past, we had it, you're an ELD one student, you're ELD one all year. ELD two, you're ELD two all year. And it worked. But again, we didn't get to some of the recognitions or the advancements with the data that I had where, you know, able to get them into honors or more advanced things. So we started partnering with the teacher a lot more. And, you know, the things that I would see, I would share with the teachers, the teachers would share what they see with me. And so we started moving ELD students as soon as their progress changed. So if you're in ELD one, but all of a sudden you're making great gains, let's put you in ELD two. Let's get you faster. Let's get you, you know, the ball rolling. Um, more advanced EL students, um, you know, how do we pick classes? Again, me meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, feeling them out, learning about them. Are they interested in engineering? Because we have honors engineering. Are they interested in math, science, medical stuff? Um, our school, because it's so hard, we just have a ton of different course offerings. So we have everything out there that we can offer our students. So um, even though they might not be in ELD specific classes, they're still partnered with EL teachers and we have labeled as EL clusters in our world. And so I work a lot with the teachers and say, you know, look out for that kid or that kid has potential. So it's, it's really me making those partnerships with the teachers. And again, you can't do this work alone. It's really building all those partnerships with every that you can at campus, even though I'm the face of, you know, anything that comes up, oh, English learners, Ruben, what are you doing with them? Ruben, how come they're failing? <laughs> I don't know why they're failing, you know? Um, <laughs> let's ask the teachers and let's dig a little deeper in a lot of things. Uh, but actually to that point, when students are struggling, I mean, I've, I've noticed a lot of patterns. So again, I can't solve every answer of, you know, if students are getting Ds or Fs, but I can dig deeper into the data and analyze it. And I've done that in the past with our EL coordinator to see why are so many students failing geometry? And we look and, oh, it's as simple as they're using this online based system that nobody actually taught them about. So we went back to the teacher, teacher, you just re teach them how to use this program. Teacher went in and all of a sudden the grades went up. So always be that the students aren't motivated for it it's again maybe there's something in the system that's not working for the students and we as school counselors can dig deeper into that data and find out what that is um, highlight the concern and let's make that change so um, yeah it's, it's complicated work but again it's, it's so many levels to it and we have decided to remove as many barriers as we can so that our students can thrive hey, can yeah. I ask you one follow-up Ruben absolutely good to see you by the way um, so did I hear you say you guys went to four by four block? So if you, which we did this year as well. So like our kids are only taking math half of the year or social studies half of the year. That's been a little complicated for our, our EL students where some of us feel they should be having something all the year. So it, are your kids taken? Are you doing it that same way where they only have math one half of the year, but in the case of their EL courses, they are getting it all year? Yeah, so we've had a, a traditional six period day in the past. This year, fortunately, unfortunately, we moved to a, a four by four model um, unexpectedly. And to answer your question, I mean, um, it worked in some cases and worked not so much in others. So I think as a school counselor, it's important for us if we have a different model like a four by four to really figure out what's the best balance for each student. So maybe for one of my students, it might be best to have an English term one and a history two so that they're language heavy content isn't all the same and maybe along the same lines, their math is in term one, their science is in term two. Um, so I think in, in that question, it's figuring out what the balance is because yeah, there's gonna be some stuff that's not there and some interest. Um, I wish I had more answers, Peter, but unfortunately that was a failed project for us and we're going back to a six period day next year. All right, thank you. I, I might track you down to have a follow-up conversation, so. For um, sure, yeah, reach out yeah. anytime, I'll, I'll help you out. All right, I appreciate it. All right, good job, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we want to respect your time. If you have any other questions, please put them in the chat. But then maybe, Alex, do you want to put, do you have, do you have a link for the survey we can throw in here? And if you guys haven't gotten to eat your lunch yet, that you can get your lunch. Um, we love the feedback, please. Positive is great. Constructive is, is better. Helps us to do better. So thank you guys for your time today. I want to thank, uh, yes, thank you, Elizabeth, Allison, and Ruben. Thank you so much for providing us such a powerful um, 
such powerful learning and information that we can use and really the power of relationships, the power of connection and really understanding and knowing our students is uh, so important. Thank you for sharing that data and the impact that you're making for providing these opportunities for our EL students. And again, that power of connection, gonna keep that in mind, that Amigo, that acronym, that's, a per that's great. So that just really sends, sums it up in a way of how to really make sure that we connect with our kids and really know them and really know that, they, that we know them that we care and we want the best for them. So thank you so much for all your insight. Great work. And thank you everybody for participating and being here. Again, I just added the, uh, the survey there. I'm gonna put it one more time. I, we really do I'll encourage you to please uh, complete the survey. We value your feedback. I believe that now you will have a break, uh, break a lunchtime, but I think there's also a yoga chair opportunity. So maybe that's <laughs> something you'd like to take a part of. Uh, go for it. Uh, but again, thank you for being part of our school counselor uh, con and uh, appreciate you being here. And once again, um, thank you to our presenters. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Elizabeth, Alice, and Ruben. Keep up the great work. Everybody else, have a great rest of the day. Take care. And I'll stick around one second more. Someone had a